Happy Wednesday night. Welcome to Deep in the Plus. I'm your host, Rob Whiteside. Thank you guys so much for being with us tonight. And always, we appreciate you. If you have not already, please subscribe to WDWNT TV for more great content. And also give this video a thumbs up as it helps people to find us. And tonight, we find ourselves with Mr. Ron Deanna. How are you, sir? Oh, Captain, my Captain. Oh, there's going to be a lot of cheese tonight, folks, because tonight we're talking about Captain America, the first Avenger. Uh, Ron, you and I talked about like, OK, we're going to do this the day after Independence Day. What's a good movie to do? And, you know, there's nothing like celebrating the Star Spangled Man with a plan. But we also uh, are on the fringe of this Rogers the Musical that just released at Disney California Adventure that I had the opportunity to go see. And we'll talk about that closer to the end. But. I do want to ask you, uh, first Avenger, first time you saw this one, uh, are you a big Cap fan? Talk to me about your motivation here. Yeah, I think I'm an okay Cap fan. Um, uh, yeah, I used to think Cap was one of those cheesy characters like most people think of like with Superman. But I think it was Cap, uh, his reboot after 9-11, uh, which kind of made me think of him in a different way. He... Uh, it's a great issue if you could find it. I forgot what volume it is. I think it's like volume four or five. The first issue starts right after the uh, attacks and Cap's going, just searching through the rubble. And Fury comes up to him and says, you know, throws the costume at him and says, you've got a mission. And Cap says, this is my mission. Th throws the costume back and just keeps digging. And that made me think of him a little bit differently. You know, not just the guy who follows orders, but the good soldier. And I think the, this movie and the movies that went further really portray that aspect of him. Yeah, he's definitely the Boy Scout, right? That's the uh, reputation he has is he's uh, he doesn't swear. He's uh, he's a true American. Um, and it's one of those things where he's supposed to represent all the good things from America. But from 1940s America, really, uh, you know, when this movie opens up, we're seeing Cap in 1942, which is around the time uh, of the war. And uh, they're they're fighting the Nazis, of course, because why not? I mean, that seems to be the common theme in a lot of these movies, whether it's Indiana Jones or uh, Captain America. But with Captain America, I think at the time that they released the original comics, this was kind of they were close enough that it was about the Nazis and the further we get away from it he's a man out of time he's frozen in most of the origin stories so that he can come back and be a modern day uh, Avenger so um, I, I love Captain America I, I don't know if you can see I've got a Captain America chair uh, I've got Captain America stuff behind me as well that like caps my guy um, I, I have a Captain America backpack that I wear into the parks when I go. So a huge fan of Captain America. The first Avenger movie was really the fifth Marvel movie that started off with Iron Man. And then it goes to the Incredible Hulk movie and then back to Iron Man 2, Thor. Uh, and then we meet Captain America, the first Avenger, as we move into uh, the Avengers and the end of phase one. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that they did a really good job doing this, but I got to tell you at the time, and I want to get your take on this at the time that this launched and they said, Chris Evans was going to be captain America. I was like, wait a minute, Johnny storm. Like he was just in the, in the Marvel world. Like, doesn't yeah. it, didn't it seem weird that he was Johnny storm and that there aren't enough guys in Hollywood that they could have cast somebody else's cap. I thought about that. And looking back, I can't, you know, it's hard to look back on that because He's so perfect. It's the, and he was a great Johnny. I mean, I've got a torch up there too, just for that. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it was weird coming to that. And it was so soon because, what was it, three, four years after the uh, not so great sequel, The Rise of the Silver Surfer. Right. It was pretty close to that. Yeah, and, and and again, you're right. It was fresh, and there are a lot of guys who have done the multi uh, Marvel situation. Um, you know, Josh Brolin was uh, Cable, and then he in the Deadpool movie, but he was also Thanos. That's a little bit different because we're not really seeing him when he's Thanos. It's all CGI, but um, there's been a couple that have pulled double duty like that. But I. I don't know. I wasn't sure. But once once we got to see him as Captain America, I was amazed from the beginning and very excited about it. Because, again, I liked Captain America comic books. And then there were some other attempts 
to make a Captain America movie. And uh, Ron, I don't know if you've seen either of these. There was there was uh, 1979. Red Wilson did two different Captain America movies, but then in 1990, uh, Matt Salinger came up. Uh, with, I don't know what I don't know what I did there uh, with this one. I, and uh, I've do what? seen. I saw the 70s. The 91 with the Italian Red Skull, because for some reason they did that instead of just making him a, you know, a jerk. Yeah, I'm just mixing it up. I'm just trying to drown you out. Sorry about that. <laughs> go ahead. Why is go ahead. I wasn't really... to that image? I have literally no idea, but go ahead. But yeah, that's a really bad movie. There's just, just thinking about like, the Marvel like MCU really did change comic book movies, but they really started, I think, changing with X Men and Spider Man around two thousand one. Um, but the nineties had like Blade, which wasn't bad. You, uh, the Batman's degraded in the nineties from every movie after eighty nine just got worse. Uh, Punisher nineties wasn't a bad series. I think it, or the first one I think they did with Dolph Lundgren came out around then but 90s if you want a good superhero story you got to kind of watch a cartoon yeah uh i guess so um but but you know the spider-man movies did you mention those like the spider-man the like those yeah. were those were kind of bad 2000 like i think people say spider-man started but i think x-men one the first one kicked it off just like i think six months to a year before yeah just for fun let's try this again there we go. All right, all fixed. So, but yeah, exactly. Uh, but you know what? This one, to me at the time, this was like the best we had, right? And and it was again the 1990s, and it was at least we had a superhero movie. Now we're so spoiled with superhero movies that it has to be good. I mean, honestly, there were a lot of them that were just kind of whatever, and uh, and now uh, it it's it's a different level. It's its own kind of penultimate genre. Uh, of of superheroes and so I'm I, I loved what Marvel has done from the beginning on all this but the Captain America movie I could not wait for that to happen uh, it happened in 2011 that we got to see this Captain America the first Avenger interesting that every cap movie has sort of had a subtitle and not all of the other movies have so it was like Thor was Thor and Iron Man was Iron Man but Captain America's first movie is the first Avenger then the Winter Soldier then Civil War um, so, I mean, we've had these subtitles, but the first Avenger movie is really kind of, it sets the stage, but we go back to 1942. And in the, in the Matt Salinger movie, they did the, the, the history part of it. The 19, you know, before he got frozen was very quick. He, he gets turned into a uh, cap. He had, he meets the red skull. He basically gets frozen after that. And then the rest of the movie is all modern day I reverse. And this one, we get to really just see him. Uh, back in the 40s for the most part until we finally get to see him unfrozen at the end. Um, and, and because of that, it feels like more of a period piece, doesn't it? Yeah, and the director was great for that because uh, I always think of him for uh, The Rocketeer, I think. Yeah. He's the same director, right? Yep, yeah, absolutely. So good at these kind of things. Um, and it, I think the origin story should be the period piece. I think people... It, it's not an origin story everybody knew amazingly well especially at the time because we said he was considered a cheesy overdone character and i think that's why the first avenger was added as the tag one because i don't think they thought just captain america would sell overseas so i think it was the first avenger was added in there to use as a title i think particularly in england and other places um but all of that was done to try and gain interest in this character to lead up to avengers and the portrayal of him really, I think, changed the public perception of the character more than anything. Yeah, you you were talking about the director, Joe Johnson. Um, he was uh, an ILM. He was a uh, he was involved in the Star Wars movies, special effects. He was, but directing wise, you, you're right. Rocketeer, one of my all time favorite movies. And again, back in a time when like there weren't a lot of superhero movies out there, and the Rocketeer to me is a superhero movie. Uh, which it also included uh, Alan Arkin, the great Alan Arkin, who just passed away uh, last week. So uh, he did that one. He did Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. He did Jurassic Park 3. He did Jumanji. Like, this guy has done a lot. I mean, you go back and look at it. He's done a lot of movies that, like, you know, that I loved. 
Um, and so it's really neat to see him involved with this movie and directing this movie. And I think he brought a lot to the table uh, for this one. But at the same time, uh, I went into it. We could talk about it when we talk about music a little bit. He actually scored some of this, which is, I'm like, what can't this guy do? He can make little models, direct the movies, and then also write the music. So I don't know, a little bit of everything. But we'll talk about the music later. Um, this movie, when it opens up, we get to see a very small, thin uh, Steve Rogers. I always wondered what they were going to do about that when we first uh, were first told about this movie, because in the in the Matt Salinger 1990s movie, they just talk about, oh, he's a regular guy, but he's got like polio side effects or something weird like that, so he can't walk. So he just kind of hobbles from place to place until he gets the super soldier serum, and now he's he can walk normal. Then this one, they go out of their way with the CGI, and I think they did a pretty good job with it. I was think I was thinking about like the way they do a lot of the facial aging and stuff like that. I think this holds up better than even some more of the recent stuff. Like I think this looks better than like Luke in the uh, Mandalorian. Like I think this effect they obviously knew they had to spend a lot of money on to get it to look right. Yeah, and you can't just like you know starve Chris Evans. And then come back and uh, and then like bulk him up. So obviously he had really bulked up for this movie. Uh, he was probably already in pretty good condition, but he was definitely top of top form as Cap. And then uh, you know they do the CGI with the the little guy, and um, you know there's some there's a a, a, a visual effects sort of uh, featurette sort of um, on Disney plus about this. And they show a little bit of how they green screened him in. He was sitting on the bed across from Dr. Erskine and, and then they bring in the other guy and then they kind of CGI his face in. But I think they did a really good job with this one. And you really buy into the fact that he's this scrawny dude so that when you have the reveal, then he's this huge guy. And like the, the, com the comedic effect of it, like when, uh, Agent Carter kind of touches him and goes, "Ooh, like, oh, okay." And he's like, "How do you feel, tall?" I've heard that actual like her reaching out was kind of a like it was the first reveal she saw of him like that, and she kind of did it. I don't know how true that story is, but I have heard that. Like that's why she stutters back. Um. Well, yeah, and it's it it's a pretty neat uh, transformation that they do, and you know, again. Uh, the Rogers the musical, which again we'll talk about later, uh, does sort of uh, an on-stage transformation as best that they can, but certainly not quite as cool as that one. So here's the scene you're talking about where she's kind of looking at him and sort of reaches out and touches him here, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I, I so, guess I think it was like an improv thing or whatever, but... So um, a lot of this thing, this is taking place in, in Cap's hometown of Brooklyn, yet it's all shot in the UK. I thought that was pretty, pretty cool the way they uh, pulled some of that stuff together. But, it, it, I mean, they were going to have to do a lot of visual effects anyway to drive us back to the 1940s, wherever they were. So I guess, you know, doing the UK or doing it in actually, actual Brooklyn probably didn't really matter too much. No, I mean, you're shooting street level. You can get most cities to look somewhat alike. Um, the, the, going back to the character himself, created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, which Stan Lee didn't really have his fingers on this one. This was created by uh, by Joe and Jack. Uh, and as a matter of fact, this movie came out in like what, it's like summer, fall of 2011, and um, and then um, Simon actually passed away in uh, 2011, so the yeah. end of 2011. So he, he was able I mean, to see was... it come to fruition way before Stanley's like Marvel time. Uh, and of course, Kirby never gets enough credit for it. You know, like co-creating everything else too. It's always, Oh, it's Stan. It's like, come on guys. Kirby created for DC Marvel. Like I'm looking at four of the greatest covers of all time, right across from me, the Galactus trilogy and silver surfer stuff. And you know, that's all him. And you know, he just never, he should be up there with Stan. Yeah, that's true. Um, this movie is, is the fifth movie, like I said, in the in the Marvel Phase 1, and the next movie after it is The Avengers. But it has a lot of important things that it sets up. Um, it's, you know, it sets up the Tesseract. It sets up um, 
uh, Agent Carter, which then became a TV series and then also a Marvel one-shot, and then also Captain Carter in the What If series. Uh, it sets up Bucky and the Winter Soldier and everything that comes after that. Um, it, it just seems like it's a very pivotal movie and all the things that it uh, that it brings to the table. No? No, it's, it's where they really can see that this was the, you know, Iron Man, Thor, Hulk, they kind of had the plan going. You could tell this is like, okay, things are working. Let's start putting the plan in place. Like, because yeah. after those first couple, they could have scrapped the whole Avengers thing if those movies had bombed. They, like, they had plenty of time. But, I mean, I don't think they thought it would, but I think this is the one where they, like, had to make it tie in directly. And for the reason that, you know, he's considered a cheesy character. But none of those guys were top selling books before their movies. They yeah. were always secondary, kind of. Because they had lost everything to 20th Century Fox and to uh, Sony because they had given away all the other, all the good stuff was already gone. The Fantastic Four, the X-Men, Spider-Man. And they were like, oh, well, what are we really going to do? And then they bring up Iron Man and Thor and Hulk. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. Now we've got something here, and uh, and they they built the Avengers, and then obviously brought in Spider Man after the fact, and now they own m almost all of it again. So, uh, but all of the pieces again put in together, uh, including Hydra. So Hydra is one of those things that doesn't didn't exist in the early uh, Simon and Kirby comics because it was just about Hitler. Hitler was the bad guy, and in this one they have the you know the Red Skull was a product product of Hitler, but he was like the, kind of like his right hand man. Then they come into like this, and we've got Hydra, and and the Red Skull is taking over the world uh, on his own. Um, I, Hugo Weaving as as Red Skull in this, I think, is absolutely amazing. Oh yeah, and I mean, just he's always a great villain, and even in Lord of the Rings, you don't kind of like Elrond because I think you don't trust him because of the way Weaving is i think in the character and and they keep the the like the the mystery of red skull if you did not know red skull and who he was from the comics etc they keep that a secret for most of the movie there's that one scene where he's having his portrait done and he's in shadow and the guy has this like blood red paint palette that he's using and uh, and so again if you didn't know if you were just watching this casually if you had come into the MCU on the hype alone and not known the characters, you wouldn't necessarily have known it was the Red Skull. But when you see all that paint there, you're like, okay, that's what's happening here. And then we finally see the big reveal when Cap goes to save Bucky. And then he, um, uh, you know, has his, his first showdown with uh, the Red Skull and he pulls off his face, which, I, you know, I guess they're just showing that, like, how great this is. But all I'm thinking is, how many of these faces does this dude have stored up? Was that the only one? You know, he doesn't put it back on, right? No. So that's it. And I think there's... I, I don't know if it's true because I was, wasn't close enough to TV and I wasn't pausing. But I thought I've seen some stills and I could be told I'm wrong. It could have been manipulated on the videos. But, like, you could see some stills where there is some, like, weird creasing around his neck to give you a hint something's up. But I don't know how... Like, I'm not sitting there, like looking at my TV like this and pausing every second to get those shots. Why not? Why wouldn't you be doing that, man? Um, so I, I have this question, this theory, of like this thing that I was thinking about. If Cap doesn't save Bucky here, does Bucky become the Winter Soldier? I don't know. I mean, like, I mean, I guess... It, I don't again, know. What, for, what like, are, what, we don't get why he's separated out at the time. Right, exactly. So Bucky's all, like, tied up somewhere, and uh, and he goes and he finds him. And his whole purpose for going and rescuing uh, these soldiers was because he knew Bucky was there, and he, you know, he wanted to save them all, but there was a chance that Bucky was going to be there. So he goes to try to save him, and when he does, he's, you know, tied up somewhere else. And he doesn't seem to have any strength so I don't know if what they were doing to him at the time was the super soldier serum or not, because he never has any showing of super soldier from that point through them uh, traveling 
you know, with Cap, you know, taking over all of these bases. And then he gets dropped off the train, which then I assume he's picked up by the Russians, who then take him in and create the Winter Soldier. But had they not done that, had he left him there, either he would have maybe perished if he had never found him, or maybe if that was actually some testing with Super Soldier, then maybe he would have made his way out and not turned into the 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 Winter Soldier. I'm just I'm just throwing stuff out there. I just it was yeah, one of these I mean, cause and effect things where I was thinking if Cap never reaches him from there, he never drops him off the train, and he never becomes the Winter Soldier. Sorry. Yeah. No, I'm thinking about it. It's just uh, yeah, we don't know what was going on there, and you know when uh, Erskine is describing uh, Red Skull's involvement, he was co-developing it with him. So maybe he was testing things out. And I don't know if it's the writing, directing, acting, all of the above, but this movie really feels like it tells a story. Like it's not, I mean, it's really building something from the very beginning. Because if you, again, if you just come in casually as a Marvel fan, or, I mean, as, a, as an MCU fan and not a Marvel Comics fan, and it opens up with like, you know, the them in the tundra digging out this uh, this ship and then finding the the um, the shield. And then, you know, then we kind of cut back to the 1940s and we meet Steve Rogers and he's scrawny and he's he wants to fight in the war because his mom and dad were killed in the war and he wants to do his part. And he keeps trying to. Uh, enlist here and there and he can never get enlisted because he's got so many things wrong with him and so finally Dr. Erskine finds him, decides that he's a good man, gives him the super soldier serum uh, and with the help of Howard Stark makes him into Captain America and then uh, of course uh, Erskine passes away or is shot and then now we've, we've lost that but it's really telling this story starting at the beginning, I don't know what's happening if I'm not a huge Cap fan He's lost in the ice. Something's happening in the ice. I'm not sure. Now you've taken me back to the 40s, but I really do think they do a great job telling this story. Now you go. Yeah, it's for something that's, you know, the tag makes it a direct prequel to something. It's as self-contained as everything. And I think that was phase one. Like all of those stories mostly felt self-contained for better or for worse. I mean, Hulk a little bit had to play off of, is it or is it not a sequel to the Eric Bana version? Um, Iron Man 2 obviously was a sequel and played off the first one to not the strongest effect. I think everybody can admit that. But yeah, the, the first few were set up nicely as stories with Easter eggs to go forward as opposed to what we're seeing now. And I think one of the problems with the latest phase is they're too aware of their interdependence on each other. Interesting. Do you think that's what the problem is? Because, again, a lot of people say there's a problem with the MCU. It's not what we remember it being in Phase 1, Phase 2. Um, you know, to me, I well, think part of it is that the Infinity Stones was such a story that kind of slowly unfolded over the first couple of phases that when it finally ends, you're like, you haven't been seeding me for the next thing, and now it's just almost like you're starting over and you're kind of faltering and you're introducing all these characters and characters within character movies, like you know, introducing, uh, like you know, the the Charlize Theron character in um, in uh, Doctor Strange or um, uh, the Kip Harrington character in uh, Eternals. You're, it's like we already have too many to tell these stories, and now you're shoving more and more and more, which I kind of like. But also then sometimes you're left with like a Howard the Duck who just is like a background character in, you know, a couple movies of the Guardians and that's it. Because I feel like we've got too many to tell all the stories and they're not churning them out. Even though they churn out a ton, they're not churning them out fast enough to keep up with how these actors are aging that they wouldn't have to reboot. And so there's all this rumor of the Young Avengers being the next thing to happen. Um, I, I don't know. I feel like the best casting they've done was Tom Holland as Spider-Man because you can hold on to him for at least a couple trilogies. Yeah, and I think I don't think there's a problem with that. I think, particularly if you're familiar with comics, the more modern style of Marvel, and part of it is you know the characters people are less familiar with. I mean, people weren't familiar that familiar with Iron Man, but people had heard of him. And I think a lot of these more modern movies are characters people hadn't heard of before the MCU stuff. So that's part of it. But it to me, it has really, and I think this came 
to me, like, coming out of Quantum Mania, it's everything is being written by a comic, and I'm expected to start seeing those little bob, like, those little things that come up in the corner and say, C blank editor, like that you do in comics, like, C issue six of X Men, like if you were in an X Factor book and someone was monologuing, uh, describing something. So, yeah, I think that's part of the problem, and I think it's also more true to the source material at the same time. Yeah. I, uh, okay. So, so let me, let me tell you another thing that bothers me. Can I, can I, can I vent a little Ron? Please. So Tommy Lee Jones, love Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones in anything is always Tommy Lee Jones. And yet he's always amazing. You know, check every horror house, hen house. Like he's always got the cool lines. Uh, my, one of my favorites in this one is when, uh, you know, the whole saying of Hydra is cut off one head, two more will take its place. And this one guy in this battle is about to say, uh, cut off one head and another, and two more. And he shoots him. And then he looks at his guys and goes, let's find two more. And I was just like, ah, Tommy Lee. Tommy Lee always gets the good lines. Uh, I love him in this role. However, the character is... <sighs> He comes at Steve Rogers, and when Steve is, is, is scrawny, he's like, I don't like this guy. I don't think this is the right guy for this. Then they go through the procedure. They make him Captain America, and he's clearly this, like, superior soldier that, we, that, that Erskine had promised, and he's the only one. And so then, you know, he's Tommy Lee Jones's character looks at him and goes, you know what, you're you're I don't want you. You're not good. I, you, like, I never wanted you from the beginning and you're out. So, you know, they, he lets him go be part of the the whole war bond, you know, performance circuit. And um, and then when he comes into the camp and he says he wants to help, he's like, oh, you've been off being chorus girl. And it's like because you told him to like you told him. I don't want you. And so well, now you're, actually, you're mocking he, him. Go ahead. He didn't tell him to be the chorus girl. He got overridden by the senator about being the chorus girl. He wanted to lock him up and experiment on him to make more soldiers. Because he says, I'm sending you here. You're, you're going back to the lab. And that's when Senator Brand or whatever comes and says, no, people know who you are. You're a symbol now. We've got a better job for you. So he kind of yeah. got overruled by the politicians. So maybe that's the chip on his soldier on, on, on his shoulder. Yeah. Rosita's in chat says, I'm more of a DC gal, honestly. You know what? DC, we could talk for hours about what DC has done wrong in the movies because I, I love those characters and they do, they've done them dirty. So hopefully James Gunn will I've, fix that, but it's going to be a, a journey. I'm definitely more of a DC guy with my reading. I mean, probably yeah. about a five to one ratio or like four to one ratio of my books to of what I collected over the years, mainly be just because how many Superman and Batman books they put out at a time. But yep. that's what I read more through most of my life. Like definitely read a lot of Cap, a lot of X-Men, you know, Avengers and Spider-Man, but like I never got out of that kind of core group like I did with DC either. Well, I did Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor for sure, but I, and Submariner. But my my main for Marvel was always Spider Man. Uh, I you know there was one time where I was collecting forty uh, forty different titles a month, and like yeah. three or four of them were Spider Man. It was Amazing Spider Man, Spider Man, Spectacular Spider Man, and Web of, uh, and then you know Batman Detective and all those that kind of bled together but uh they really get you in the comic world because it's like you're you're collecting only detective and it's like oh this one's continued in batman or this one's continued in robin or this one's continued in red robin and superman was even worse throughout the 90s they you actually had to buy all four books they had little numbers on the cover separate from the issue number that told you the reading order for the year yeah yup um Okay, so so you think that that it was like again? I felt like there was like a yo-yo situation with the the Tommy Lee character going, "No, Rogers, you're not good enough," and then you know just go back to being a chorus girl, and then you know I I I see that you see it a different way, which which makes me feel a little bit better. Um, let's talk about um, the um, uh, the relationship with um, with Captain Carter. Um, Actually, sorry, Agent Carter at this point. 
Um, you know, it, it's it's really it's a sweet relationship that the two of them have, and it's definitely something that permeates the through the the rest of the movies because as he goes back to the the future and he he gets to check in on her in the uh, in the Winter Soldier, I believe, and then um, or no, is a Civil War. It's Civil War where she passes no. away. It's Civil War where she passes away because it's during the Sokovia Accords. Yeah, it's the trees. You have a whole tree speech. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where, um, you know, it, it kind of carries on all the way through. Did you watch the Agent Carter series? Because I don't think those are canon, right? Those two seasons? Um, that one's tough. S.H.I.E.L.D.'s been taken out of canon. The Netflix stuff is canon, is now officially canon until something contradicts it. I'm not sure which one Carter falls into. I think it's canon until it's contra in that kind of canon until it's contradicted thing. Um, yeah. Yes, I watched them when they first came out, but I have not watched them since. Well, and the cool thing is that you know we meet young Howard Stark in this, and and then they use him later on in Captain Carter. I mean, in Agent Carter the series, and then they also use him, I think, in that short. And then in some of the flashbacks that they do with him as well. And then, you know, obviously there's another guy who plays Howard Stark in the later years, um, which I think is kind of cool that they do it that way. Um, how many times would you say you've seen this movie? Probably at least a dozen. Really? Uh, yeah. Is this the one you've seen the most, you think? Or do you think Iron Man? Because a lot of times when I go back to, re like, a new movie's coming out, I'll go back to the beginning. So, like, Sorcerer's Stone on uh, Harry Potter I saw yeah. so many more times than, say, Goblet of Fire. I did that, but it's impossible now with these. Um, but it's also, I think, of all the individual series in the MCU, it's the most solid of a trilogy. Like, the three of them together are the most solid movies and winter soldier is my favorite mcu film by far i think uh so this goes with that watching them together yeah civil war is definitely my all-time favorite uh, and i think just because it introduces tom holland's spider-man it introduces t'challa it introduces you know i mean it i it's I, I i love that movie the the comedy when paul rudd's character meets uh meets cap for the first time and there's just so many fun lines in that one um you know it feels like where bucky and uh, and uh falcon kind of like forged their uh unlikely friendship so, so, so great I don't know. like the dialogue <laughs> in that scene yeah uh dawn says peggy is one of my faves you know what's funny is that uh again teasing the rogers the musical conversation so many peggy carters in the first showing that i got to see at dca that women coming in with the bright red hat um and uh, it, it's really it's really neat, the fandom that Peggy has. And she's in so many of the movies. I mean, she opens up Ant-Man, uh, you know, in that whole, like, um, the, the opening scene where she's in there and, and Hank wants to get, you know, to, to keep the Pym particle from getting out. And she's in that one. And then, you know, we see her in, uh, obviously, in, um, in the Multiverse of Madness. Uh, so Haley Atwell has really gone back to the well a bunch of times to be Peggy Carter. Definitely... She seems like a, a character people want to see more of all the time. Uh, but the reason I asked you about how many times you've seen it is I've got a couple trivia questions for you, if that's cool. <laughs> why do you have that face? Why? Why? No, no I try to watch for those. I tried to watch for those numbers and stuff in the background, and I just so so you would have been disappointed had I not come up with trivia. See, See? I I know it's coming. Yeah. All right. All right. This is going to be easy. And by the way, thank you guys for watching. If you haven't already, please give us a thumbs up. Um, so uh, here's 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 an easy one. When he is trying to get uh, into enlisted in the army, he uh, he he gets the same stamp over and over again. Uh, it's a it's a number and a letter. Do you know Four what F. that is? Yeah. See, look how easy that was. Uh, and then when he gets approved, what is that? One A. Or IA, I'm not sure. I think it's 1A. Um, the shop where they get, uh, they go into, and it's this super top secret shop where they go in and have a code word and they get inside and yet the Nazi uh, spies already in there, or the Hydra spies already in there. Uh, what's the name of that shop that they go into for his transformation? Brooklyn Antiques. Did you know I was going to ask that? 
No, I just noticed it. I just yeah, okay. I'm like, see, oh, I'm like actually looking to see if there's a clever pun or something in the name. Actually, when uh, I was watching it last night, I'm like, no, there's not. It's just Brooklyn Antiques. It's lazy. Yeah. But I guess that's if you want to hide something, you don't make it clever. Yep. Uh, by the way, um, we have. Uh, uh, hold on a second. I, I want to uh, give a shout out here to um, uh, to Rosita, I believe, who has dropped us a super chat. Um, and it says, "I'm done packing, and I want to show my love for the show. Hope to see you all on the sixth. Uh, see you at the sixteenth, Robin Ron. I don't, I, Rosita. Thank you so much. We appreciate you so much for the super chat. Um, I, Ron, and I don't think we're going to be there. Ron, you're not going to be at the sixteenth anniversary uh, celebration this weekend, right? No, no, not this time. Okay." So we'll catch you next time. But thank you so much, Rosita. I appreciate it. I'm glad you were able to uh, check in with us while you were doing your packing. I hope you have a good time there. Um, so we'll talk about that at the end, too. Um, here's the next trivia question. You ready? Yeah. Uh, this is, again, it's an easy one. Um, the cab that the guy, that the spy uses to, to make his escape, what is the name of the cab company? Um. I didn't see that. Just probably New York Cab or something generic. No, it was Lucky Star Cab Company because he had the the. It was like the little throw to the uh, the star on the door the, the when he shield, uses it yeah. as a shield. Yeah, I th I always thought that was like it was a really super cheesy and at the same time I thought very cool that uh, you know that he's holding up a you know what equates to a shield, but it's really the door to a cab. Um, I think that scene is pretty pretty neat the way that that one works out. Um, That's one of the best scenes of the movie, I really think. Yeah. So the the door is back here, and he runs to pick it up, and yeah. So the, it's when he decides that he's looking he at that now. It shield. looks so much more like London than Brooklyn. You're right, right. Uh, yeah, it was in the UK for sure. Um, and then, um, um, when Peggy is trying to talk to Cap, when he's like, uh, I'm not going to make our date, uh, can I take a rain check, uh, get a rain check? And she says, sure, I'll meet you Saturday at 8 p.m. Where? Uh, it was like an S word club or something like that. I can't remember exactly. Like... That is that you're in the neighborhood, buddy. Uh, I can't remember the exact word. Like it's not like Scat Cat, but it's S something. Stork Club. Stork. Yeah. Uh, and then here's the last one. See again, there there weren't a ton of them, uh, but uh, the uh, and part of it was just like you know Patrick always gets on me like, hey, I'm just trying to enjoy this movie, man, and like now I've got to look for every like little little thing that comes up. I I wouldn't pick anything obscure like somebody's license plate or anything unless it meant something, but. Um, but I, I I enjoyed watching this movie again, so I only picked out a few things that I just happened to notice. Um, when he wakes up in the future, they're trying to convince him he's still asleep in the 40s. He's listening to a baseball game. Who's playing in that baseball game? Uh, Dodgers and I think the Phillies from 1941. The, the uh, scene is lifted straight out of the Ultimates. That is correct. It is the Phillies and the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, yeah, there you go. You didn't do too bad. And I kind of wish were... they did the whole thing in the, the other thing in the ultimates where Fury comes in and tries to calm him down. He's like, yeah, that's not going to work. The, you know, there's, there's no black general in the army. The, t the highest black man in the army was a lieutenant who I happen to know or something like that was like the line from the books in that scene. I thought that would have been interesting to add up, put into the movie too. Yeah, I, I wonder when they when they made this movie, um, <clears throat> because again, the you know most of it happens in the past. Uh, it starts out in the tundra in the future, like in present time. And then it goes back to the past with him, you know, showing the character of who he is and and what how much he wants to do good, and then him getting chosen to be, uh, you know, the super soldier going through that process and then trying to. Uh, make something of himself even against the uh, adversity of we don't think you can do this you were the wrong guy 
um, and then he, you know, single-handedly takes over and 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 rescues these guys, and then uses the Howling Commandos to to go and and take down all these other Hydra bases. And you know, we learn about the loss of Bucky, which then writes the future of the uh, the Winter Soldier. And then he, you know, he he finally faces the Red Skull and and has to sacrifice himself in the tundra uh, to um, uh, to save the world, really. And so then we see him wake up, and we've got a very limited amount of time in modern day before we, you know, we get the whole, you know, Captain America will return in the Avengers. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I kind of personally feel like I wish I could have seen a little more of him in the future. Do you think that they balanced that correctly with this movie? I think him being the fish out of water for Avengers was kind of part of it, right? Like, you know, all these heroes are emerging. If Captain America had been out there doing things ahead of time, I think that would have lessened the impact of everything in Avengers because you know, the government's still trying to, like, are still angry that people like Tony are out there doing their superhero thing on their own. So if Cap was out there, you know, in the public eye, I think that really would have made Avengers a different movie. Yeah, I get that, I guess. Um, you know, I most of the time with Marvel movies, I just want more. And I was so surprised how, like, much of the tag was literally a trailer for Avengers. Well, and there were there was a couple other movies where they did that too, and I'm, uh, I forget which one it was. Was uh, it I the... mean, this one literally showed footage from Avengers. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the end of uh, Winter Soldier does that too, right? Or is it end of Ant Man where where he's uh, they they have Bucky in the vice grip. And uh, it's that's footage directly out of Civil War. I think it's the end of uh, uh, Ant Man because he's they've got B Bucky's arm in a vice grip and he's waking up and he's like, I think we need some help. And then uh, and then Sam Wilson goes, I think I know a guy. And that this footage, isn't just a scene from it, like it's a montage trailer. Yeah, showing Loki and walking through and him being right. all it's, cuffed. It's a, and, total, it's a yeah. total teaser trailer, yeah. And yeah. I think they did that. They do it occasionally, particularly. Was it Strange did that again? It was the know. trailer so for it's... Strange. It was the trailer for yeah. Strange, and I don't remember which movie was right before Strange, but it was the trailer for Strange because when you went to the to see the end credits, that was it was all the Multiverse of Madness teaser, um, and, and you're right, it was like a straight up commercial. Um, but the, uh, you know, uh, the MCU seems like it's in, it, it's in a weird place right now. I, I, I was in the movie theater watching Guardians of the Galaxy 3 and, uh, in the men's room afterwards, somebody said, I heard somebody say, um, well, that makes up a little bit for Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania. <clears throat> I didn't hate Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, but it definitely wasn't the movie I thought it was going to be. It's, it wasn't, and it didn't feel like an Ant-Man movie was part of the problem. I think the way the comedy did not work great with the action and the characters that they had being funny weren't the typically funny characters in it. Uh, and the stakes felt too high for Ant-Man. Ant-Man's a fun heist. You know, all of the Marvel movies used to have a, a like more of a subgenre than just being a superhero movie. And right. that's, these have all been just superhero movies. Um, Maybe, and is that riding on their own coattails? Is I'm trying to do too much? And Ant Man, I think, was just trying to do too much, trying to yeah. set up the next. Like this was the beginning of things going forward. Like this was the first of Phase Five because Phase Four was kind of a reset, and I think it was too much of a cool down period. And yeah, it was you may be too right. long and things like that. I think Ant Man was fine. I think there was a couple fixes I think I said I would have mixed. It's like, take the comedy out of the quantum realm and leave that serious. Add the comedy back in by having the comedy characters, uh, the three thieves or the security guys, like his partners, have them in the real world trying to do stupid things to rescue the team. That's how he would have done the comedy in that one and tied it in and left 
what was a deadly serious plot be a deadly serious plot. Yeah, no, I get that. Um, and, and for anybody who hasn't, and, and I assume if you're watching this with us that you have, but for anybody who hasn't, it's great to see that uh, that they have arranged uh, all of the Marvel under the Marvel banner. They've arranged it by uh, phases. So you can see phase one, and uh, they include the one shots in between and have it all in order of where they fall. And then you've got Avengers. This ends Captain America, and then it ends with Avengers, and then this one shot. And then when you come into Phase Two, you've got this Iron Man three, that Agent Carter one shot, Thor, and on and on here. Civil War starts Phase three, and then Phase three ends with uh, Avengers Endgame, but actually ends with Spider Man Far From Home, um, which isn't on Disney Plus yet. And then uh, you've got the the phase four, which starts with WandaVision. And like you said, it's kind of all over the place. We're meeting Wanda and her aftermath and the Falcon and the winter soldier and their aftermath and Loki and his, and a prequel for black widow and the what if scenes and uh, uh, you know, the Eternals, which had, I think has gotten panned pretty hard moon Knight, which I think is underrated, but again, you're right. It's like, it's kind of all over the place. And then the Groot shorts, which again, I don't understand why they're not in one pocket. Uh, Werewolf it's by not, Night. It's a which... show. They don't want to call it a show. They want to have yeah. more titles because even now, as they're removing things, it, Disney Plus always had the least amount of titles of any of the streaming services, and now they're pulling things off. Yeah. Um, uh, here's a question I mean, for like, you, though. If, go ahead. If you were going to do a rewatch, is this the first or the fifth movie in your rewatch of the entire MCU now? Do you watch it oh, you mean oh, you mean because the people like the whole Star Wars thing, right? Like, do you watch it prequels first? Um, I I still like watching it in the order in which it was released. Um, I get what you're saying. Like, a lot of people start with Captain America and then go Captain Marvel because that happens in the '80s and uh, early '90s. And yeah, I I don't know. I I would watch it in the order in which they were created, probably. Would you not? No, I start. I I actually start with this Star Wars. I. I do hatchet. Well, if I was introducing Star Wars to somebody, I would do hatchet order or machete order, whatever people want to call machete. it. But this, yeah. I actually think you don't ruin too much of a plot by starting with this and then go Captain Marvel and then throw now Black Widow in right be between, like somewhere between Civil War and uh, Infinity War. And, and when this, when they first launched Disney Plus, there were still some movies missing. Most of those are starting to find their way here. You can now find the Hulk movie, which is a Universal property. Uh, we were just now, talking about that. It, it, yeah. That just showed up like a week or two ago. It did. It did. Uh, yeah, because I think when you had said it, I was like, I, I don't see it on there. And then boom, there it was. So that one, uh, and then the first Tom Holland um uh, homecoming movie is on here and I think that uh, Far From Home and No Way Home are also still going to be on their way if they're not already uh, so that you can watch all of them together because that was a thing when I was telling people how to watch the Marvel movies I'd go now the Hulk isn't a must watch because it's not you know Mark Ruffalo but it does connect in some small way at the very end uh, you know you should watch um, you know, you can watch that one separately, but it's not on Disney Plus. Now, almost all of them uh, are here for you to be able to watch them all in order, including those one shots that were on DVDs. Um, so let's talk a second uh, about Rogers a Musical, because Rogers a Musical was mentioned in Hawkeye. And I have been so excited to see this one. And I've got I got my shirt, my Rogers Musical shirt, um, <clears throat> because it's it's the retelling of of Captain America and it's it it was you know in the Hawkeye series he's sitting in a Broadway theater with his family watching this thing he turns off his hearing aid cuz he just doesn't want to hear it uh Hawkeye gets kind of made fun of in within the play and then now we've got um um uh, we've got him watching this and we hear the music uh save the city and then they go and they write an entire 30-minute musical uh, and release it at Disney California Adventure in the Hyperion Theater, and it just opened on Friday. And I, it's so funny because I thought it was awesome. Uh, I and again, I'm kind of a little bit of a of a um, of a of a, a Captain America geek, but uh, I was expecting nothing of this really because it could have been very campy uh, or you know or cheesy. It was campy. 
I, I let me let me make no mistake about that. It was campy, uh, but it was also sort of sincere in the way that it was put together. And I I enjoy the music. I would buy the soundtrack if it was available. Um, if it were to I'm get sure bigger. It will and, be. Well, I hope so. I hope it's available to stream at some point. But we were there the morning of the very first showing, and we went and got the VIP package, which was twenty nine dollars, and it got oh, you a bucket bucket of popcorn, a um, a Rogers the Musical popcorn bucket, uh, and some uh, red, white, and blue kettle corn, and then also a drink and a lanyard, and then you got to go and be the first ones to sit down uh, in the theater and get your own seat, so we were able to sit in the front row on the side, and uh, I, I, I think they did an amazing job with it, so I, I was very excited to see it, uh, and yet I would talk to some cast members, and they were like, I, did you see it? Yeah. What did you think? And they were like, meh. They were like, it's okay. Uh, I think part of the problem was some of the people said that they didn't think that it told enough of the story because it's only 30 minutes and it goes from introducing it basically retells the entire movie that we just reviewed uh the um the the first avenger and then goes into the battle of new york and then kind of comes out into endgame so like it kind of goes hard for a 30 minute show uh but i i thought it was i thought it was well put together and it's only running at the hyperion until august 31st which again yeah, why do you crazy. think that my theory is it's going to be on one of the ships uh Maybe the i treasure. was told i was told by somebody there is a reason but they wouldn't tell me what the reason was they just hmm. said there's a reason uh somebody who would know the other thing, um, but but again, I, I would highly recommend it, especially to anybody who loved uh, the the first Avenger. But um, yeah. the other thing, I I'm haven't watched it Go specifically ahead. because I'm I know I'm not going to get out there in time, but I try not to spoil things if I unless I have to for a show or something. Um, yeah. But so in Hawkeye, I think there was it was intentionally bad as a joke for musical theater people, like what they were doing. Like, that you could hear different other shows and stuff that they were kind of poking fun at themselves through in that. Is this presented more sincere, or is this still a little more tongue-in-cheek? A little bit like, we know this isn't the best thing in the world, but we're going to play it sincerely. I think it's played a little more sincerely, honestly. I mean, they still do the same Save the City song, and they still have the whole Hulk smash from the uh, from the um, from Hawkeye, that scene is very similar uh, in itself. But it's, I mean, I don't know, man. I, I I don't know how to describe it other than the fact it is, like I said, a little campy. But the music was good, um, and I thought that the staging was good too. If you wanted to just watch the transformation scene, that's available on wdwnt.com or on uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, as well as the show, the the full show, if you want to watch it. But I get what you're saying. I do the same thing. I don't want to go and watch a ride through of an attraction that I might actually get to do. Um, so you know, that's that's one of those things that I'm I'm holding out hope that this finds a home somewhere uh, because it it does seem pretty good. But it was sold out the very first day when we were there. The the first show sold out in a couple minutes. Um, the the VIP part, and then they have the virtual queue if you don't want to do the VIP thing, and the virtual queue um, they give you the opportunity to be in the lower or the mezzanine, and then if you can want to do standby, they kind of reserve the the high. Uh, have you ever been in the Hyperion? Yeah, I've seen. I I definitely Aladdin. saw um... Aladdin or Frozen. Which was a uh, Aladdin, Aladdin was, was first. first, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it first. I think I specifically didn't go to see Frozen because um, I'd already seen the Broadway. I'd already seen it on the ship. I'm like, okay, I think I've seen enough live versions of that. There's other things I want to do in that park. But you know what? You're you're right. But the thing about this one is, isn't, since it's only 30 minutes, it goes by pretty quickly as opposed to Frozen. I feel like was 60. I mean, it was long. Yeah, they were long shows. Uh, but I would definitely recommend it. I would love to hear feedback from anybody else who went and, and saw it because, uh, you know, for me, I really liked it. And I, I do like to like things. I will admit that. But at the same time, if it wasn't enjoyable, I wouldn't tell people that they should go see it. So I um, would love to hear what other people think. But before we do that, yeah, was I was it worth a to... special trip because my in-laws are trying to talk like we're trying. We've been talking about doing a special trip for that. But 
I don't know that it's worth a special trip, but uh, there there was always something new to see and do, right? Like they just updated Indiana Jones uh, out there uh, with some of the original effects to it. I had never seen Magic Happens before this. Uh, I wanted my family to see Wondrous and um, World of Color 1, and uh, my daughter had never seen Avengers Campus or the uh, Snow White's Enchanted Wish. So there were a whole bunch of different things and reasons to go out there. Um, uh, other than this, but I think that's definitely why I I, uh, I aimed at going at this time was to be able to see the the very first show, which was exciting. And, that, and now this was not the very first show, this very first public show. The first show was a um, a D twenty three gold member exclusive, which sold out in like milliseconds. Um, it was crazy, but it was the same thing. It was about it was thirty dollars, and it got you all the things that the VIP package does. So you can still have that experience. That's not even a bad not. like. It's What's not. a bucket of pop? Like a collectible popcorn bucket's like twelve, fifteen bucks. A drink is five. A lanyard's probably ten anyway. So, really, if you like the merch, you're getting almost a, a seating for not next to nothing. Well, and but they have a little. Been, I guess even their dining package is for, like, excuse me, for like candy, like processional, are only five bucks more than like ordering the three courses would be on average, like. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I was going to say they also have a lounge area that you can hang out in before you go in for the show. And they also have a photo op that they where um, a uh, photo pass photographer will take your picture in what looks like a giant Rogers playbill. And uh, and that that photo is included uh, with the VIP experience. So, yeah, I do. I, I think it's probably the best package deal uh, as far as affordable pricing. And I'm shocked that they did it at twenty nine dollars. But. You know, but again, for a family of four, that starts to add up. I mean, we're talking up. about 120 bucks for four of you to go see a show inside a park you've already paid to go to. So, and not everybody needs the popcorn and the merch when you're well, doing a full yeah. family. And you, yeah, you got a family of four, and you have four buckets of popcorn. I mean, not like I'm not going to take a popcorn bucket if anybody knows knows me. I love me a popcorn bucket, um, but at the same time, you know, except it, they don't it, do it, the refills out there. Well, now, aren't you Mr. Complainy? Um, no, that actually was on my trip last year. I we, went, we did the cruise on the West Coast and went there, and I brought the popcorn bucket into the park specifically to get a refill. And they're like, oh, we don't do that here, only at World. Yeah. I'm like, really? Dawn says, I missed DLR. I haven't uh, been since 2019. Yeah, there's a lot that's changed. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, Dawn, it shut down for a year. <laughs> if I hadn't gone last year, I probably would be a little more eager to go for this. Well, I, I honestly feel like there'll be another time where you can see this. I feel like either they'll do a font, like a, like a nice polished version for Disney plus, or they, like you said, they'll put it on a cruise ship or, um, you know, maybe they'll move it to another theater. I don't know, but it was really well done. Well staged. I thought it was a great, great telling, but it, it made me, it, you and I had already agreed to review this movie and it made me want to go back and revisit this movie so badly after seeing that because it has so many of the elements. It's a 30 minute show. It probably spends 20 minutes retelling, uh, the first adventure. Yeah, I caught parts of it. Laura watched it, uh, watched our video of it. Um, and it does go all, does it go all the way through to his disappearance at the end mm -hmm. of Endgame? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, it does. So, again, it was, it was, it was really neat the way Sorry, they Sorry, spoilers it for... <laughs> for anybody who hasn't watched Endgame by this point? No, that's fine. Um, anything else we want to talk about before we wrap this up, buddy? Anything else in particular about the, the this specific movie? No, and you know there's rumors of him coming back, and I hope I, he does because he just owned that role so incredibly well straight through. Um, I, I I do have a question for you before we go on. Is that when I ask you if we were still going to be reviewing this movie, uh, you sent me four emojis. <clears throat> you sent me a shield, a flag. A peach and a thumbs up. What's the peach stand for, Ron? I don't understand. Hmm. <laughs> uh, are we allowed to say that word on this channel? <laughs> sure, sure. You know what? He has America's ass. And there you go. There you go. He's a star-spangled man with a plan, and it's America's ass. Um, uh, so uh, thank you, guys. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and, and, and answer the question that everybody needs answered, Ron. 
This is the one that I don't think that there is any surprise in tonight's, but you could throw me for a loop. I don't know. But Ron Deanna, would you recommend this movie? A hundred percent. As I said, like if you're introducing someone to the MCU, I'd say give this one first. I think it actually might between this and Iron Man, it's a tie for the first, the best of that first, uh, you know, first phase. And I think more people were familiar with Cap to begin with. So yeah, I think if you haven't seen it, I don't know who you are at this point, but uh, <laughs> definitely, you know, it's as key to the MCU as anything with the Tesseract, aka the Cosmic Cube, which is. One thing I wish they had actually called it that in the movie, but that's probably as big of a complaint as I can get on this movie. Okay. Um, you know, I, I for me, I would say that I absolutely would recommend this movie, but for me, I like where it sets uh, as the movie right before the Avengers because the rest of the team is together. Now we need to learn about Cap, and we move forward from there. My wife would always fall asleep during this movie, which is funny because she loves period pieces. But I think that because it is kind of, uh, it takes you back to the war. Um, I, I, I think that there's something about that that didn't sit with her. But I love this character. I think they did this character an amazing justice with this movie. Um, this leads the way. I, some of my favorites are the Captain America movies. And I, like I said, Civil War and No Way Home are probably my two favorites in the entire MCU and uh, I think this was an amazing movie. And I, if you have not watched it, if you have not sat through it, if you thought to yourself, you know what, I'll start at Avengers and move on, at least come back and watch this one because it, it is uh, a great movie. And I do think that Chris Evans does an amazing job. Joe Johnston does a great job of storytelling. We didn't talk about the music. Two things that I wanted to mention in the music is one of the songs was co-written by Alan Minken. And one of the songs was co-written by Richard Sherman. So the fact that you have a Sherman brother and Alan Menken co-writing some music in this, which at the time wasn't officially a Disney movie, because it was still a Paramount movie, uh, I thought was pretty amazing. Alan Silvestri does the score, which uh, his music is is transcendent. He and John Williams could just write everything, and I'd be fine with it. But um, But then having these other guys involved with it was pretty cool. So um, I, I, the music was great. Um, I, I, the directing, the story, uh, and it sets the stage, like you said, with the Tesseract, but also with Agent Carter and also with Bucky, the Winter Soldier. So we don't really, you can't really have those things until you start here and know and really understand what's going on. So, um, and thank you guys to everyone who's watching tonight. Don't forget we've got news tonight as it's 250th episode tomorrow night, which is the beginning of the 16th anniversary of WDWNT as the network. Uh, and then uh, Sunday night, we are going to be doing Park Center with a, a long run of Park Centers moving forward because we're free of the holidays. Uh, we're going to do a bunch of Park Centers moving forward. So please join us Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern uh, for Park Center. We would love to talk to you more about Rogers the Musical and all kinds of other things that happen in the parks during the week. Uh, and then also, if you are not already, you can become part of the family, uh, one of our WIGS members. We love our WIGS, the WDWNT Interglobe Society. You can check it out, patreon.com forward slash WDWNT. Thank you, Ron. As always, sir, I appreciate you. Uh, you have your own channel. Uh, yeah, I do movie reviews on a channel called Ron Hasn't Seen, where I go back and watch uh, movies that are kind of in the, you know, public eye for winning an Oscar or being considered a classic. Uh, the last, I just published a video for once, the uh, Irish indie film that won for best song in 2007. Nice. Uh, my next one coming out next week will, it's another comic book movie because I'm kind of doing a Comic Con month and it's about the opposite of this. It's about as bad of an adaptation that just took nothing from the source material and that's Catwoman. Nice. Nice. Okay. It took me right. to force to have a channel to be forced to watch that one. So, well, Ron, I appreciate your insights as always. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for watching, for being Wigs members, for being watchers of Deep in the Plus. Next week we will be back with Anastasia. Uh, finally, that is on Disney Plus, and we'll be watching it with our own Allison and, and uh, from Park Center, and uh, it'll be a, it'll be a fun time. So please come back and join us next Wednesday night for Deep in the Plus. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next time. Okay, thank you so much.